Well, good morning, everyone. Man, I'm glad you're here. I bet you're glad you're here too, aren't you? Yeah, you will be. You will be. If you're not now, you will be after you uh, hear Abdul Murray. But uh, welcome. I hope you had a great Christmas. Was it very meaningful and uh, rewarding? Was it a merry Christmas? Yeah, you know we're in the fifth day of Christmas. You know that the 12 days of Christmas? The fifth day. So a little test for you. What's the, the present for the fifth day? Five partridges? No. There's five golden rings. That's right. I heard, I heard that. Somebody said that. Well, I don't have any golden rings for you. But what I do have is an introduction for Abdu Murray. Abdu has, um, has been a friend and a ministry partner of Oak Point Church for many, many years. And we are absolutely delighted to have Abdu here. We wish uh, that his, his wife, Nicole, could be here. But if you'd like to meet Nicole, and believe me, women, you would come to the, to come to the women's uh, kickoff, and uh, you will meet uh, Nicole at, at that. Uh, we are delighted to have Abdu's uh, daughter, one of his daughters here, here with us. Thank you for coming. Abdu Murray is a speaker and a senior vice president with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries and the author of four books, including his latest, Seeing Jesus from the East. That book is scheduled to be released in April of 2020. So this is advanced notice. You'll, you'll want to, to see that book. I can't wait for that one. Seeing Jesus from the East. For most of his life, Abdu was a proud Muslim who studied the Quran and Islam. After a nine-year investigation, into the historical, philosophical, and scientific underpinnings of the major world religions and views, Abdu discovered that the historic Christian faith can answer the questions of the mind and the longings of the heart. Abdu has spoken to diverse international audiences and has participated in debates and dialogues across the globe. He has also appeared as a guest on many radio and television programs and at universities all over the world. And he is also the host of the new upcoming RZIM podcast, The Defense Rests. Abdu holds a BA in psychology from the University of Michigan. Go blue. And he earned his Juris Doctor degree from the University of Michigan Law School. As an attorney, Abdu was named several times in Best Lawyers in America and also in the Michigan Super Lawyer. Everyone, let's give Abdu a warm Oak Point welcome. Abdu Murray. Well, thank you for that uh, generous introduction and that warm welcome. It's always great to be here at Oak Point. It's um, a real pleasure because, uh, you know, I, I've been here several times, uh, know and love the staff here, and a lot of the faces I've seen in the crowd today are actually quite familiar, some unfamiliar as well, which I'm glad of, because I love to meet the new people um, here at Oak Point. And um, I go to a wonderful church in Sterling Heights. I see, um, some of you don't, don't know this, but I'm actually from the Detroit, Michigan area, and uh, make my home here, even though I do ministry all over the place. Uh, and I love coming and speaking at local churches. We have some partner churches who do a wonderful job of spreading the gospel, of preaching the word faithfully, intelligently, credibly, and compassionately. And Oak Point is no exception to that. And it's wonderful to be here with you all today. So um, I love the fact, by the way, <clears throat> that we played one of my kids' favorite uh, songs, Carol of the Bells, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra version, the, the very rock and roll kind of screaming guitar at the end of it version. By the way, that was beautiful. You guys did an amazing job. That was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> and then Joy to the World. See, as a Christian, um, I, I came into some new information. I wasn't raised in the Christian church, so I didn't know some things about the way the, the Christmas works. I just knew it was trees and gifts and Santa and Rudolph and that kind of stuff, very superficial, very commercial. But then as a Christian, I learned how deep it actually was. But one thing that I learned as a Christian is the 12 days of Christmas actually are Christmas and on, not before Christmas. I thought that they were the 12 days that preceded Christmas. So when Christmas is over, I'm like, oh, well, and that's that, it's over. Um, this long season of Christmas that starts in July and ends on uh, December 26th um, was finally over. Uh, it is bizarre to me. It's funny, as a Christian now, now that I know the depth and the meaning and the point behind all of Christianity, to find that Christ Christmas has a season, an exceptionally long season, and Easter has a weekend, which is weird because Easter is the sine qua non holiday 
of the Christian faith. Sine qua non is a fancy Latin term that I get to use to sound intelligent. Um, what it means is without which nothing. In other words, if you don't have this, then you have nothing. And Easter is the sine qua non holiday of Christianity because Easter commemorates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if there is no death, burial, and resurrection, then there is no Christianity. You might as well chuck it. Yet, for some reason, I know we commemorate Easter through communion uh, observances and these kind of things, but really we don't have the same pageantry and the longevity for a season and the number of songs and the 100 Hallmark movies or whatever it was that came out this year commemorating uh, East, uh, Christmas that we do for Easter. It's a very strange thing to me because, and the reason I say this is because as the sine qua non holiday of the Christian faith, Easter is, gives you meaning as to why we celebrate Christmas in the first place. Christmas is not over. It's the fifth day of Christmas. The reason why it's the fifth day of Christmas is we're celebrating the advent for what? You're not celebrating the birth of some guy who said some interesting things and taught us to love our neighbors and upset the Romans and then died because of it. That's not what you're celebrating. You're celebrating the birth of the Savior, the Savior of the world. How did he save the world? By paying a debt that we could not afford to pay by on the cross, dying to pay that debt in that tomb for three days and then rising from the dead to prove that he has the power over death and the life that he can give us. That's what Christmas really is all about. So Christmas is a meaningful holiday because Easter is a historical reality. And so if you connect the dots between these two holidays, the Januaries and the Februaries of our lives, when there's nothing really great happening except for my birthday, um, nothing really great happening then, I think that many of us have a lot more Januaries and Februaries in our lives, a lot more gray, a lot more cold than we do the, the pageantry of December. But you can get through those Januaries. In fact, you can transform those Januaries and those Februaries into Decembers if you connect Christmas and Easter. Because Christmas does make Easter possible, but Easter makes Christmas meaningful. It's a year-round celebration of the advent of the Savior, and we wait for him to come back. Now, I begin that because we're in a world right now that is full of cynicism about the Christian faith, about Christians as people, and about the whole thing. You know, you look at the commercialization of Christmas and of all those movies that have come out, and that number of 100, I was not exaggerating, that's the number of movies that have come out this year alone about Christmas, and almost all of them are about recovering the true meaning of Christmas. And what is the true meaning of Christmas at the end of all those movies? Family and being nice to each other. That's what they're about. Or finding that special someone to share Christmas with. Uh, Christmas with. I mean, think about the songs. What's that one song, that George Michael song, Last Christmas? Now it's uh, remade by um, uh, Taylor Swift. What is that song about? I have no idea what the song is about. It's about him breaking up with somebody and then finding a new girlfriend. How is that a Christmas song? Because he mentions the word Christmas in it. It's like magic. You can make millions of dollars without mentioning Christmas once in a song. But you see how superficial that actually is? And so the world is rightfully becoming cynical about the most meaningful parts of Christianity. And it's beginning to see Christians not just as deluded dupes, but as dangerous people. So there was a debate that happened a while back, years and years and years ago, I think maybe a couple of decades ago actually, between a Christian and an atheist. And the debate topic I think was, is Christianity good for the world? Something like this. And <clears throat> the best part of the debates is when you have the crossfire. I'm a debater, I've done plenty of them. Uh, and as a trial lawyer, I can tell you this is part of the best part of that job too, the most fun part, is when the other side starts to throw the barbs at you and ask the tough questions and the zingers as it were. And so it was the Christian's turn to ask the atheist a specifically poignant question. And so he asked the, the question of the, the atheist this way. Now, I'm going to modernize it to include the cell phone generation because this was, this was a, a hypothetical he, he, he posed well before smartphones. He said this. He goes, so let's suppose your car breaks down in a very sketchy part of town. 
a part of town where crime is very, very high. You're, you don't know, you're not familiar with any of the streets, any of the areas there. Your car breaks down, it's immovable, it's there. And it's dark, it's midnight. And the rain is coming down and your cell phone is dead. And because your car is dead, you can't charge your cell phone with the car. So you have no way to communicate any loved ones or uh, the auto club or anybody else to come and pick you up. You have to get out of your car and everything's closed, it seems. So you might have to knock on someone's door at a house in an unsafe neighborhood. They might not answer. You might have to go to four or five or six or seven doors before someone actually gives you help. And if they answer the door, you have no idea who you're going to be getting in the first place. And they might see you as somebody who's not from around here and not want to talk to you anyway. So you're sitting there very much in fear for your safety. And then you look half a block away and a, house, a light in a house turns off and four young men walk out of the house, strongly built young men, and they stand at the stoop of the house and they look over and they spy you. They see you. And one of them points at you and nudges to his friend and all attention goes your way and they begin to walk towards you. He said this to the atheist, would it or would it not matter to you if you found out they had just come from a Bible study? <laughs> now the point of course was to say, of course it would matter, you'd feel much safer having believed that. Now I'll tell you this, in this day and age, and I know enough clever debaters who would turn that around on me today and they'd say, oh yes, Absolutely would matter. It would terrify me more if I was transgender or gay or a Muslim or a Sikh who wore a turban. Yeah, it would scare me. It turns around now. It's been two decades and that's the perception. It's an unfair perception. It's unfair. It's not even commensurate with the data, with the facts, but that's the perception the world actually has of what Christianity has become, especially in the West. When you see the words Christian, conservative, or evangelical uh, out there, there's a, there's a visceral reaction. But if you put them all three together, there's a, a quite loud reaction. That's what we're seeing today. So the question becomes, how do you provide the idea of Christian truth? How do you convey the, 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 specific, the specificity and the majesty and the glory and the beauty and the profundity of the Christian message to a world that thinks we are terrible messengers? Because here's the reality. The credibility of the message is always judged by the integrity of the messenger. And the integrity of the messengers is perceived to be very low. That's not fair, but that's the perception. How do you persist? in Christian evangelism at all, in light of all that. And it's interesting I bring up evangelism because if you look at the, the, the uh, statistics for Gen Z, the generation just below the millennials, when you ask them whether they're Christian or not, in fact, Christians think the same way in Gen Z at a large, alarmingly high rate, you ask them about evangelism and sharing their faith, most of them will tell you they think it's wrong not a bad idea, they think it's morally wrong to share your faith with someone else, including people who go to Sunday school. That's a staggering and bewildering and dumbfounding fact. But there you have it. How do you, how do you overcome this? How can we overcome this whole thing? Now, I think it's important for a number of reasons to do this. Obviously, we have the, the need to profess Christian truth in our lives and in our words for this, just because we were commanded to do so, but there's more to it than that, and I wanna unpack that for you as well. And we can see some examples. The examples I wanna highlight for you today are Jesus and Paul. Obvious examples, right? I mean, it's like Jesus is always the example in every sermon, and he's going to be in this one too, uh, because he's the world's most influential figure. It would be weird if I didn't talk about him, especially at church. But Paul as well, Paul's very important to talk about because Paul was hostile to the Christian faith. Paul was an enemy of the Christian faith. He today, if when he was Saul, if he was around today, would be the ones using the cesspool of snark that has become Twitter um, to denigrate the Christian faith. He would be the person who would stand up at the talk show uh, and be one of the talking heads to shout down someone or keep them from speaking. He would be a person who would be protesting a, uh, a Christian point of view at a university. That's who he would be. But then he became a champion of the Christian faith. 
someone who was breathing out murderous thoughts and actually go, leading people to prison, suddenly became the champion of the Christian faith. Now I bring him up for a number of reasons. One is because I wanna provide a sense of hope for you, is that if you're living in a world where you think that it's all going to pot, it's all going in a bad way right now, and kids today kind of a thing, have hope, because if it can happen for Paul, it can happen for anybody. If it happened then, it can happen again. It certainly can, and there's a hope there. But there's another reason I bring up Paul, and the reason is this. Talking about Paul's transformation and the way he actually acted with compassion and used his travails and the discomfort he had as a Christian to reach out to those who were non-Christians, this actually uh, speaks to and responds to a common objection that people have about the Christian faith. You know, I deal in apologetics. Apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith. The word apologia, the Greek word, means defense and you find it in the Bible. You're not being sorry about anything. You're actually just progressing and professing the truth of Christian scripture and the truth of the Christian message. Well, one of the objections against Christianity is that Paul invented Christianity, that essentially there was this very works-based, very Old Testament-based system that Jesus taught, and then Paul comes on the scene and through his powers of persuasion, influences everybody away from the law, wants to abolish it, he invented the doctrines of grace and justification by faith alone, and that he's the one who invented all this. Of course, that's a very powerful argument if you don't have the facts, but the facts remain that Paul didn't invent Christianity because he displayed a familiarity with Jesus' life, he quoted Jesus, more often than you might think, and everything he said was consistent with what Jesus taught, including and especially Jesus' idea about living self-sacrificially for the sake of a world that hates you. That's a very bizarre thing, isn't it? We're in a world now where we're obsessed with gaining Twitter followers, Instagram followers, uh, and whatnot. We're obsessed with being liked but we, 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 we achieve those likes based on how much of a gladiator we can be against those who don't agree with us. So the more viscous, or, or not viscous, but the more vicious and the more um, virulent our language can be about those people, whoever those people are, well, they won't like us, but everybody else on our side will really like us because we are a gladiator. We want as many you know, people in our tribe as possible. We want to become their champion. And that's a very difficult thing to, uh, to live in for any length of time and then not have a divided world. And we have a quite a divided world. Paul lived in such a world and then tried to counteract it. Jesus lived in such a world and did, in fact, counteract it. He changed the entire world. He really did. He honestly did. I want to read from you a passage of Scripture. If you go to John chapter 13, verses, verse 1, starting at verse 1. It's familiar. Very familiar. It's the story of the Last Supper. It's on the night Jesus is betrayed. He sits down with his friends, those who had served with him, who had witnessed miracles, performed some miracles of their own, in fact. For three solid years, they gave up everything to follow Jesus. One of them was going to betray Jesus that very night. And Jesus does this for them, beginning in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now I wanna pause for a moment. Put a pin in that. He loved them to the end. To the end, I want you to put a pin in that because we're gonna come back to it. There's a Greek word that captures this idea of loving them to the end that's used here that is incredibly valuable and powerful and actually pervades the entire message of scripture, just there alone. Maybe it's because I'm from the Middle East and I'm an Arab and I love the way language works and I see these little patterns here and there, but I think one of the proofs of the divinity of scripture is the way words are so beautifully woven into the different gospels, written by different authors, into the Old and the New Testament, written by numerous authors across three different languages, across multiple continents and multiple centuries, yet all of the message coheres in the same theme. And this word, I think, will give you at least a clue to that. So he loved them to the end. Verse two, during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, 
Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. Skip down to verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. The juxtapositions within this passage are staggering. Here is Jesus the one by whom, through whom, and for whom all of the universe was made. He is the necessary being, without whom all things would not exist unless he existed himself. He created everything and chose to incarnate himself in a body in an obscure outpost of the Roman Empire. And what does he do? With all the glory and all the majesty that comes from being the creator of everything and the master of everything, he washes people's feet. Now, if you're from the Middle East or an Easterner, you know this. You can see the, the, the Easternness just radiating out of this story. I remember growing up, my father would tell me, if you go to someone's house, <coughs> or they come to your house even, doesn't matter, and you're sitting around having tea and talking, and you cross your leg, like whether you do it you know, sort of man style or whatever it might be, if you cross your leg, never let the bottom of your shoe face another person because that's considered an insult. This is, you're saying like, this is what I think of you. You're lower than my shoe. It's considered an insult. So feet are considered like a dirty or unclean thing there. But if like, the, the Indians in the room, and I see there are quite a few of you here, which is fantastic, you'll know this, is that when someone who is an elder or honor, uh, someone who you want to honor is in the room and you want to give them an honor, you reach, be, uh, reach down and touch their shoes, touch their feet because you want to say, I'm humbling myself in front of you. I think this highly of you that I'm willing to touch your feet. This whole idea of washing feet is, is, is an illustration of the humility that Jesus himself has. What's interesting to me about the story is Jesus could have said, wash people's feet or serve other people, and he did. He could have said that, and that would have been it. They would have believed him and said, good, we'll do that. He didn't. He didn't just say it. He did it before he said it. Now, one, it's because as a good Middle Easterner, he wants to give you an object lesson that will stick in your mind. But the number two reason, probably even the number one reason, is because he wanted to actually wash their feet. You see, in the ancient Near East, in a home, if you had guests over, you'd have someone stationed outside the door with a bowl and a rag, and they would, as people came in, as they would want to get the dust off their feet, they would unlatch their sandals, untie their sandals, leave them at the door. You would wash their feet in the bowl and wipe them dry, but you'd have a servant who did that, and they would walk in with um, uh, cleanliness and walk into the house and feel comfortable. So you had a servant, essentially what amounted to a slave, who would do that. Jesus acts like a slave to his disciples. He acts like a slave. He doesn't just talk about being humble. He actually acts humble. Juxtapose this with what John the Baptist said. You remember the story. John the Baptist is this powerful speaker. He's preaching repentance and baptism and all these things. And then people are so taken by John's authority and his power that they say, are you the one to come? Are you the Messiah? And what's John's response? He says, I'm not the Messiah. He says, in fact, one is coming after, after me. The laces of his sandals or his, the latches of his sandals, I'm not even fit to stoop down to, to untie. I'm not even as good compared to this man as a slave who would undo the sandals of someone in their home and wash their feet. That's how great he is compared to me. I'm not even a slave compared to this man. And yet this is the very man who unlatches the sandals of the disciples and washes their feet. How do you like that? And we get upset because it's becoming more and more uncomfortable in this country to become a Christian, and that's true. But here's Jesus with all this humility who lowers himself to make a point. Now here's what I want to bring Paul and the Gospels and all this put together. 
See, Jesus does this in John chapter 13, where he points out that he is being such a servant that he is embodying what it means to be the lowliest of servants, the lowest kind of servant you can have. Not the cook, not the one who cleans the house, but the one who washes feet. That's the kind of servant he is. He's not just a servant. He is saying, be of the lowest kind. And in doing that, by the way, I want you to understand what he's done. There's more to it than just acting like a lowly servant. He doesn't just say, look how low I am in a false humility. What he does simultaneously is he humbles himself while elevating the very office of the lowest servant there. He dignifies the foot washer. Only the Lord of glory, the Lord of history, the Lord of language, the Lord of all creation can at the same time humble himself while uplifting someone else. That's amazing to me. Amazing. And then you see it in Mark chapter 10, verse 45 where he says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So you see it in the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you see it in the Gospel of John, the theological Gospel, where he humbles himself and shows his humility, but you also see it in Paul over and over again where he talks about Jesus, who abased himself, who came down into this world, who emptied himself and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself a lowly servant, took on the form of a servant to live among us. Take on the form of a servant. Do you see the consistency? To say Paul was not consistent with Jesus is to ignore the facts. He is consistent with the very words Jesus said and the very actions Jesus demonstrated. The consistency is amazing here, but Paul didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. In Philippians chapter one, verses 21 to 24, he has this remarkable, remarkable passage. Every time I read it, I, I'm sort of taken aback by it. In fact, I'll just confess to you something. I've done this two times before. This is my third time giving this very message. And every time I've said it out loud, I've thought of something new to tell you that I see in this passage. And I refrain because of the amount of time that I have. But so much is in here. What does Paul say? Writing from prison for the sake of the gospel. He is in prison for the sake of the gospel. And he says this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You ever just marinated on that one for a while? Just let it sink in. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is gain? How many of us actually believe that? It's a hard thing. Hands go up. And I believe that you believe, it, believe that. But not all of us can say that. But we can have a strength to allow us to do that. I'm gonna demonstrate that shortly. There's gonna be some people I wanna introduce you to, visually, who, who lived out this to die is gain. But he has this phrase, for me to live is Christ. We don't really think about that one very often. The to die is gain one is so stark and so pungent that we think about it. But to live is Christ, we don't think about it too often. What does he mean by to live is Christ? Well, he explains it in the very next verse. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. In other words, to live is Christ, to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. You are to use this life as an opportunity for fruitful labor. And then he goes on to say, but I really can't choose because it's valuable to be here, but being with Christ is so much better. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two, he says. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. In other words, my soul was made by Christ to be with Christ. What did Augustine say? Augustine says, O oh, oh, oh Lord, our souls are restless until they find their rest in thee because they were made for thee. That's the very purpose for which you and I were created, is communion with God. And that's what Paul is saying, is that if I go to be with Christ, if I die here, and the end is coming soon for Paul, if I die here, it's better. I kinda can't wait, but I can't tell. Should I go with be with Christ or stay here? Why stay here? He says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Not for his. Paul doesn't wanna keep his life for his own sake. Paul wants to keep his life for other people's sake. 
To live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is the gain of knowing and being with Christ. But to live in this world is the sacrifice Paul is being willing to make. The strange, ironic, paradoxical sacrifice that Paul was willing to make is to stay here for our sake so that he can live a life that reflects Christ. And how does he reflect Christ? in this consistency of his message, he says, I am here to serve you people and the world around me to live like Christ. Because what did Christ do? The very incarnation, the very idea that God would leave his throne and incarnate in a man, live amongst us, need to eat and sleep and all the rest and be with us and endure us. How long must I endure you, he says all the time. He is irritated by human existence, not in a way that's like, oh gosh, I have to put up with you, eye roll kind of a thing. It's more like, just a little while longer, and I'm gonna fix things, but, I gotta, but we have to endure this for a while. In other words, the very fact of the incarnation is already sacrifice. We think of Jesus' sacrifice as the cross, and indeed it is. It is the ultimate form of the sacrifice that he performed for us, but his very existence on this earth is already sacrificial. He's already doing that when he was born. Christmas was about the sacrifice to come, but the sacrifice that already happened. What did Augustine say, once again, about what it meant to be the incarnate word of God in Christ, in this little baby? What did he say? So beautifully he said it long ago, when he said that he so loved us that for our sake he was made a man in time, though through him all times were made. He was made a man who made man. He was carried by hands that he fashioned. He was born of a mother that he created. He sat in wordless infancy in a manger. He, the word, without whom all human eloquence is mute. That's what it means for him to come into this world and sacrifice the majesty and set it aside for our sake. He says it in Philippians chapter two, verses six and seven, Paul says it. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That's a humility that really explains what Paul means when he says to live as Christ. In other words, to live as Christ is to live self-sacrificially for the sake of others. That's why the golden rule is the golden rule. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter seven? He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He doesn't say, do unto others so that they will do unto you. It's not quid pro quo. He doesn't say, do unto others so they don't do bad things to you. He doesn't say that. What he says is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, do good things for other people even if they never do good things for you, even if they hurt you. Now, without getting political about this, we're in a world now where it very much seems like it's us versus them. And we don't want to give an inch because we have our rights to think of. And yes, religious liberties are increasingly in danger in the West. The very birthplace, the very, well, the modern birthplace of the idea of religious liberty as a part of the, the charters that make up our nations is the West. And yet the West is the place where religious liberties are being suspect. They're being put under pressure now. And we want to rise to the occasion and sue and do all these things. And there are times when we should do that, absolutely. But there are times individually in our own lives when we need to say, I'm willing to set aside my rights and live up to my responsibilities to be a light in a world that hates me. The Christians did this in the very first centuries of the Christian movement. They really did, and they conquered the Roman Empire, not by weapons, but by their kindness and by their compassion. It was the pagan emperor Julian who was writing to his generals in the early years of the Christian movement where he was feeding them to the lions and persecuting them left, right, and center, and he said something interesting. He said, it is an insult that the insipid Galileans are winning the hearts and minds of the people because they serve not only those in their community, but they help those in ours. In other words, Christians were helping their persecutors with their needs, and the persecutors were being undone by it, and they were becoming Christians. Yes, we need to stand up for the rights of other people, and maybe even our own rights sometimes, but we also need to think about the way in which we do it. 
or the times in which we say, you know what, I'm gonna pass for a moment so I can reach out to the persecutor and speak to them. But why? Why would you do that? Does it make any wise kind of sense? I think it does, but I think in our superficial intuitions, we think, well, that doesn't make any sense. We should vanquish our foes. We should defeat them legally, physically if we have to, whatever it might be. Why would we do this? It doesn't work anywhere else. But it does work here. It does work here for some reason. So why would you actually act self-sacrificially to a world that is hostile to the Christian message? As a Christian, why would you do that? Two reasons. The first and most primary reason is because Jesus did. And as a Christian, with, of course the word means little Christ, you're supposed to act like the Christ you follow. And if he did it, then you should do it. That's all there is to it. But there's more to it than that. And this goes back to John chapter 13, verse one and following. Remember what I told you to put, to put a pin in when he said that he loved them to the end? The Greek word that captures that phrase, loving them to the end, is the Greek word telos, T-E-L-O-S, telos. The word telos means purpose or design or, a, or aim. So he loved them with a purpose. He loved them for a specific purpose. What was the purpose? human beings in and of themselves, the value of every human being in and of themselves. You see, there are two different kinds of value or purpose that, human be that, 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 that we live with in this world. We have intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Now follow me for a moment here, okay? Intrinsic value, something has intrinsic value when it's valuable in and of itself. In other words, its very existence, the kind of thing that it is, makes it valuable. So human beings are inherently valuable in virtue of them being human beings. Now you might say, well, what is that? how does that happen? I mean, really, if we came from uh, uh, simpler forms and if we evolved from the muck and the slime into this today, or if we're, as Lawrence Krauss calls it, cosmic pollution, if we're just a bit of nothing, the flotsam and jetsam of the universe, then how do we have value? Great question, I'm not sure we do. But if we were created by a God who says you are created in our image, in his image we are created him, male and female, he created us in his image, then we do have an objective value because the source of all of existence is God and he says, as the objective reality giver, you have objective value. What that means is you cannot lose it. You cannot lose it, you have it. No matter what you say, think, believe or act like, you have intrinsic value because you bear God's image. You can't even take it away from yourself because you didn't give it to you. Now what does that mean for us? It means that we ought not to treat people as means to an end. Is that quote unquote, those people, whoever they are, and they are always wrong, have you noticed that? We are always right, they are always wrong. And they're always horrible and we're always saintly. We're made in God's image. Now how do I know we're made in God's image? How do I know that? It's not because the Bible tells me so. The Bible does tell me so. And Jesus does say it too. He says, did you not read? In the beginning he created them male and female. In his image he created them male and female, he created them. So how do I know that's true? Jesus affirmed it, he said that's true. He died on a cross, and he claimed he would die on the cross to pay the penalty that we deserve to pay. If he died and stayed dead, I would have no reason to believe him, but he died and rose from the dead, so I have every reason to believe him. And I can tell you, I've debated many people on this issue. You can look it up online, the debates. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, this Easter that we celebrate that connects Christmas, is so powerful it's one of the chief things that got me to convert to becoming a Christian in the first place. And I've looked into it ever since then. It's been 20 years almost since I became a Christian. And the evidence has not gotten weaker in my mind, it's gotten stronger. Not because of a confirmation bias, because I get more and more of it all the time. He said we're made in his image. We have an intrinsic value. The universe did not give it to me. Stephen Hawking did not give it to me. My parents didn't give it to me. God gave it to me, and therefore no human has the right to take it, nor can they. So I have an intrinsic value, and that was the telos for which Jesus loved them. He loved them because of the sake of their own value. 
Now, things have extrinsic value as well. Extrinsic value is something has value when it's, used, when it's useful for a purpose. And I think of like a hammer, for example. A hammer has extrinsic value because you can use it to build something. And that's something you use to build. Let's say you're a carpenter. That's what you do for a living. You're in construction. And you use a hammer. So it has a high extrinsic value because you use that tool to provide a living that can allow for you to take care of your, your family, your husband or your wife or your kids. Because they have intrinsic value. This hammer has extrinsic value because it's useful for you to help them to live. See that? Now for me, a hammer has very low extrinsic value because if you know anything about my handyman skills, you'll know that a hammer is not a tool that I can provide a fa living with my family, for my family in. It's simply a tool that I use that has the potential to injure me. Um, but it has a low extrinsic value. The problem today, my friends, is that in a world where we're reducing each other to machines, chemical machines, or sophisticated chimps, we're not seeing each other as intrinsically valuable. We're seeing each other as extrinsically valuable. Do you help my cause? Do you help my agenda? Can I use you to benefit me? So it's no wonder that we're treating human beings, whether pre-born or post-birth, as means to an end and discarding them at alarmingly high levels, despite all of our quote-unquote civilization. But Jesus loves them with an extrinsic purpose, with the telos. So if Jesus loves and acts sac self-sacrificially for that reason, we are required to do the same thing. I want you to think for a moment of who they are, okay? Who, who is the they in your mind? In your life, personally, in your personal life, or politically, or socially, who are the they? The people that you're not thrilled with whose posts on social media or whose stories in the news make you roll your eyes and make your blood pressure go up a little bit, or make your eye twitch, which, whichever one. Think of them for a moment. Now, superimpose upon them the image of God and that Christ died for them as much as he died for you. They start to lose their themness and their theyness, and they take on an usness. And then we are compelled to live self-sacrificially for them, for the same telos. Now here's where the beauty really happens of scripture. And this is what I just love the way, when you study scripture and you study the way the words are actually used, some stuff creeps in that's remarkable. So the word telos tells us the purpose for which Jesus loved them. He loved them to the end, to the purpose of their very value. And then when Jesus is dying on the cross, he has some last words, some final words. And what's the final words he says? He says, tetelestai. Tetelestai is a financial term. It means paid in full. Whenever you had a debt or some kind of a loan you had to repay, if someone uh, got the repayment, they would stamp on the, on the document, tetelestai. It means paid in full. It means accomplished. It means the purpose is fulfilled, okay? The word telos means purpose. The very root of the word, tetelestai, the last words Jesus says is tetelestai. Telos is in the middle of that word. So the crucifixion, the death on the cross for our sake, for God so loved the whole world, is in there. That's exactly what the purpose was. We are to live self-sacrificially. As Paul Lee Tan says, we, a Christian must be a mind through which Christ thinks, a heart through which Christ loves, a voice through which Christ speaks, and hands through which Christ helps. Everyone, without exception. That's how the world will begin to say, you know what, I want to listen to this message in the first place. I don't come to think of you as mad, bad, or dangerous. One of my colleagues put it. That's when the message starts to resonate a little bit more. I wanna show you a picture that really resonated with me and rocked my world quite a bit. And many of you have seen it before. It's an image that is slightly disturbing, not because it's graphic, because of what's going to come right after it. Here's the picture. Do you remember this? 21 Coptic Christians are wearing orange prison suits and ISIS, this is not a dig on anybody's beliefs or worldview, whatever, this is about those men. ISIS lined them up and told them on the shores of the Mediterranean Ocean, if you renounce your faith in Christ, if you renounce being a Christian, your life will be spared. 
and if you don't, you will lose your head. Every one of those men on their knees cried out, Yeshua, which is Jesus in Arabic. Every one of them cried out to Jesus, knowing that that word would end their life. I remember reading Philippians 4.13, a passage of scripture that many of us have said, and we have rightly said it, when we use this passage, it says, I, I can do all things through him who gives me strength or through Christ who strengthens me. We've used this phrase all the time when we say, okay, I can, I can, I can, I can pass the exam. I can pass the boards and become a doctor or I can save my marriage or uh, I, can, I can beat this illness. I can beat this diagnosis. And that's a rightful use of that passage. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But what this passage says is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, it doesn't mean I can lick this problem. I can, get, I can find the happy ending through Christ who strengthens me. We often use it for that means. We say I can do all things. I can get there. I can accomplish. I can win through Christ who strengthens me. I've seen numerous Olympians, when they get the gold medal, quote that passage of scripture. Nothing wrong with that, except it's only so deep. What he says is, I can do all things, including shout out Jesus' name, knowing it will kill me. Knowing that the end will not be happy. That's why when I asked the question, how many of us believe, truly believe that to die is gain and hands went up? You know what I like to ask? And I, this is not pejorative, this is true. And I know that you can, you, can, you can draw on this. And if you raised your hand, you know this is true about yourself. In your strength, you would not be able to say to live is Christ and to die is gain in and of your strength. It is the Holy Spirit, it is God in you who infuses you with that strength to be able to say that. How do I know? Here's this picture. Contrast that with an article I read about an executioner. He's the chief executioner in a country I won't, I won't name. Has a lot of public executions, a lot of them. And they asked him a question. What's it like and all this kind of thing? Well, they asked him, what's it like when you walk into the room, you and the staff who are with you, and you pick up the guy from the cell to go out to the main platform in public where there's a block where the guy's gonna lose his head? What's it like? How do people react? He said, you know what's funny about this? Is that no matter how tough the baddie, no matter how mean and nasty and ornery the person, the accused actually is, no matter how bad they are, Every time they go to stand up in defiance of the sentence they've been given, all of them, without exception, their knees buckle and they fall to their knees and start to cry because their strength melts away. Yet these men didn't. Why, are they braver? No. I learned a very valuable lesson from 21 men I will never meet this side of heaven. They could do it, not because they had their own strength. They could face that because they had a strength that does not drain away. They could do all things to Christ who strengthens them. And through that, they became, what another phrase of the New Testament says, they became more than conquerors. It is becoming increasingly uncomfortable to be a Christian in this world and in the West, but we're not persecuted yet. Some of us maybe individually, but not most of us. It's uncomfortable. But can I tell you this? It's not boring. It's not. It's not boring anymore. You know, in the 80s, it was easy to be a Christian because everyone said they were a Christian. And so we were largely ignored as a sort of like a white noise. But now being a Christian is considered a bad thing, which means when you speak, people will listen. They might not agree. What did John Piper say? They may shout at it, they may crucify it, but they will not yawn. We need to be vocal with compassion. We need to have that strength because the world is waiting to hear and is desperate need to hear of a message of life. But our attitude needs to shift. We need to look at those who are they and not see a one-dimensional person who happens to be on this side of the issue, whatever it might be, but see the entire person, the entirety of that person and say, this is a person who bears God's image for whom Christ died. I think of F.W. Uh, of F. Borum, who wrote the, an excellent essay. And he has this phrase where he talks to us about, when we look at people, we're a little too shallow about how we look at people. Even Christians do this, where we categorize people a little too readily. 
into one camp or the other. And this is what he says. The fact is that we are too superficial. We glance at a man and at once tie an imaginary label around his neck. We classify him as a Christian, or as a heretic, or as a skeptic, or as a backslider, and we think that that settles the matter. But our work of classification is very much more complicated than we think. We forget that a saint and a skeptic can dwell together in the same skin. Lord, I believe, there you have the saint. Help thou mine unbelief, there you have the skeptic in the same man. The prophets love to talk of a time when the wolf should lie down with the lamb, but in many a heart, the wolf and the, and the lamb dwell together even now. Great wickedness and great wistfulness often lodge in the self-same heart. Great wickedness and great wistfulness often lodge in the self-same heart. Many of us have the wolves in our lives and they keep you up at night and you have the lamb in your life that gives you, that assuages the fears and calms you down. And if those of you are in this room who don't believe, there may be more wolves than there are lambs. And if you do believe, or you don't believe, I should say, and there are times of calm, that's a wonderful gift from God. But can I offer you something specific? Can I offer you something that the world wants to keep you from? If you're not a Christian and you're here in this church, there's a reason you're here. Maybe it's curiosity. Maybe it's to stop your friend from bugging you and finally say, I finally did it. Will you stop asking me? Maybe it's one of those things. Maybe you're here because you really want to know what is this all about? And in a cynical world where Christmas has become about Frosty the Snowman, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, is there more to it than that? Can I find some way to get over my Januaries and my Februaries? And the answer is yes. Yes. The wolf inside you and the lamb inside you can lie down together because the Lamb of God has overcome the world. And he's there for each one of us. But if you're a believer and we've too easily seen other people as they, and we have not changed our, heart, mind, our, heart, our mindset and our hearts so that we can look at other people and offer them the credibility of the gospel and take the slings and arrows, as it were, of this existence. We need to change our view as well. There's only one way to wake an apathetic world, and that is to live with a radical, bright, shiny, fiery self-sacrifice. What did Spurgeon say? Spurgeon said, set yourself on fire because men will come from miles around just to watch you burn. Do it. We need you. The church needs you. This world needs us. God does not need us, but he gives us the opportunity to be a light that catches on fire. And we live in a, we can be part of a church that can impact the world. This world is nothing compared to the kingdom of God. It really isn't. It really is not. It seems powerful, but it's not. Let me close with a poem written by someone who was talking about the value and the, 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 endure, the enduring quality of the church compared to the kingdoms of this world and the empires we face now. We face media empires, and we face social empires, and we face, you know, issues empires. Maybe not Roman empires, but empires nonetheless. But there is the kingdom of God that overcomes these things and it lives in us. Can we speak credibly in this world? And this is what he says. Oh, where are the kings and the empires now of old that went and came? The Lord thy church is praying yet a thousand years the same. We mark her goodly battlements and her foundations strong. We hear within the solemn voice of her unending song. For not like kingdoms of the world, thy holy church, O oh God, Though earthquake shocks are threatening her and tempests are abroad, unshaken as eternal hills, immovable she stands, a mountain that shall fill the earth, a house not made by hands. You have strength because Christ gives you the strength. This house has the ability to withstand the floods that come and the tempests because it was not made by hands. These walls are irrelevant. It is the character of self-sacrifice to live humbly, to understand the nobility of the humility of servility that Jesus had, of knowing that you can be noble in your humility and in your service to others, and the world will eventually see it, that's what changes people. We pay for things with currency, and in this world, current truth is a low value, it seems to us, but you can raise the value of truth with the currency of integrity. The, the currency of self-sacrifice with actually living like we love those who hate us and we pray for those who persecute us. May each one of us do it. Let's pray.
Father, I'm so grateful for the example of your son, for the message he gives us, but also for the acts with which he lived and the resurrection with which we can have power, for the hope that he provides, for the love that he exemplifies. May those of us who bear the name Christian actually live like the little Christs the name is meant to convey. May we live self-sacrificially, not just for those who love us, but for those who hate us, for those who despitefully use us, Lord. May we see others not so superficially, but deeply, and understand that wickedness and wistfulness can live in the self-same heart, even in our own. For those, Lord, in this room who don't know you, I pray, Lord, for transformation. I pray, Lord, for them to embrace you today, that they come to know the peace and the joy and the happiness that can come from embracing you as Messiah and the one who can deliver them from themselves. And for those who do know you, Lord, I pray that they see that message as so valuable that it not be commonplace, and that they don't align with a party or a group or a tribe, but they align with you, the maker of their soul, the one for whom they were made. May each of us find a commitment to you, whether it's a new commitment or a recommitment to follow after your son and live like he lived and be conformed unto his likeness, even unto his death if need be. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for the very privilege we have of hearing your word and being able to talk to you in the first place. We offer this prayer to you in the name of your son. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.